Then the sky moved, heaved and billowed and tumbled and tottered. The moon rocked. The stars tumbled and clattered and fell one against the other. The great star groups were scattered and many of them, loosened from their holds, came flashing to the earth. They were heralded by a huge mass, red and glowing, that added to the number of falling stars by bursting with a deafening roar and scattering in a million pieces which were molten. This is a story by indigenous tribes in New South Wales, taken from the study Cosmogenic Mega Tsunami in the Australia region. The study was published in 2007 and in it, it details mega tsunami damage all across Australia. I've made two videos on the mega tsunami that struck New South Wales and you can find a link to them in the description below. One of the regions with known mega tsunami deposits is in the Kimberley region of Western Australia, which will be the focus for this video. The northwest coast of Australia, including the Kimberley region, shows significant evidence of a mega tsunami. The wave that struck this area approached from a direction between 235 degrees and 270 degrees and covered approximately 1500 kilometers of coastline. There are indigenous legends in the Kimberley region that are now supported by geological studies that recount a massive and fast flooding event from the ocean, filling inland tidal bodies like Walcott Inlet for up to 12 hours and reaching the tops of 500 metre high mesas. The Kimberley region's coastline shows clear signs of having been battered by a mega tsunami. Unlike ordinary tsunamis triggered by earthquakes, this wave likely had a cosmic origin, a comet or meteor that impacted the ocean generating a force so powerful that it reshaped the landscape. At Walcott Inlet itself, the entire region is scoured down the Paleoproterozoic bedrock. A mega tsunami could definitely do this, considering the amount of force generated by such an event. The sheer volume and speed of the water would create immense pressure as it rushed inland, capable of eroding even the most resistant rock layers. As the wave surged, it would dislodge and transport sediments and debris, stripping away the overlying materials and exposing the ancient geological formations below. The physical evidence of this event is staggering. The tsunami is believed to have reached as far as 40 kilometers inland. In certain regions, like at Broome, it deposited layers of sand up to 40 meters deep on the lee sides of headlands and laid down bedded gravels on hills situated over 5 kilometers inland. These deposits are an order of magnitude greater than those produced by historic tsunamis originating from volcanic or earthquake activity in Indonesia, underscoring the extraordinary nature of the Wanjina event. Right near Broome, we have a sediment slide that exceeds 40 kilometers in length. In fact, it may have reached 70 kilometers inland, with it flooding and following topographical lows until it reached the zenith of its power where it then receded. The transportation of oceanic material 40 kilometers inland is highly unlikely to occur from a typical tropical cyclone or storm surge alone. Such an extreme distance is generally associated with the effects of a tsunami rather than a cyclone. Cyclones can generate significant storm surges, especially in low-lying coastal regions, but these surges typically only push oceanic material a few kilometers inland. In extreme cases, particularly where there are flat, low-lying coastal plains, the surge might extend farther but anything close to or over 40 kilometers inland would be exceptional and highly unusual. Storm surges from even the strongest cyclones would be unlikely to carry oceanic material anywhere near 40 kilometers inland due to the rapid dissipation of water energy as it moves inland, coupled with natural barriers such as dunes, vegetation and elevation changes. Tsunamis, on the other hand, can push water and debris far inland. Tsunamis have much greater energy and can maintain their force over much greater distances. One only needs to watch footage from the Japan 2011 tsunami to see how powerful a tsunami is when it comes to inland flooding. It had a maximum height of 40.5 meters in some areas. But if the stories are correct, the Kimberley region was struck by a tsunami that was capable of reaching 500 meter high mesas. The Wangina event is believed to have occurred around the 17th century, specifically between approximately 1620 and 1730 AD. This timing is inferred from geological evidence of a mega tsunami in the Kimberley region and is supported by radiocarbon dating of sediment layers and indigenous legends associated with the event. The most powerful tsunamis can carry oceanic material tens of kilometers inland, and I speculate that this occurred here. This area is by far the most striking out of all the areas that we will look at in this video, likely because the tsunami rose in height as it was funneled into the bay. If you look closely, you can see scarring in the land that suggests the wave surged inland and spread out following natural topographical lows. This type of visual damage immediately dispels any sort of aeolian process. 
Aeolian processes involve the erosion, transportation and deposition of sediment by wind, typically in arid or semi-arid environments, leading to the formation of features like dune deposits and desert pavements. These processes are driven by the wind's ability to lift and carry particles, shaping landscapes over time. This type of striking visual evidence far exceeds anything that wind could form. There is evidence of catastrophic erosion in small streams as well as the disturbance of sandstone boulders on flat landscape surfaces. These features suggest a powerful and recent geomorphic disturbance, likely the result of a cosmic airburst and associated tsunami. Cape Voltaire has been extensively studied for its distinctive geological features shaped by the Wangina event. The basalt headland at Cape Voltaire presents significant geological features. On the northern side of the headland, the flow from the tsunami has sculpted a smooth, undulating ramped surface into the column of basalt. Notably, there is a lack of debris excavated from this area. The debris eroded from the northern side of the headland has been carried by the tsunami to the sheltered lee side, away from the impact of cyclone waves. The column of basalt blocks here are oriented in the direction of the flow, approximately 350 degrees to the northwest. The ramp rises approximately 20 meters above sea level positioning it significantly higher than the reach of typical storm waves or cyclonic activity. The morphology of the landscape here suggests that the erosive force of the tsunami was powerful enough to reshape the geological framework of the region. The alignment of these blocks on the sheltered lee slope provides compelling evidence of the tsunami's path and strength. Walcott Inlet is a crucial site for understanding the impact of the Wangina event particularly through its rich tapestry of indigenous legends that describe rapid inundation and the resulting flooding. Local stories recount how, in the aftermath of a catastrophic event, floodwaters surged violently from the ocean, reportedly reaching the tops of the high mesas surrounding the inlet. Geological evidence further corroborates these oral traditions, with disturbed sediment layers and deposits found at high elevations, indicating that the region indeed experienced extensive inundation due to the tsunami's force. Collier Bay stands out as another significant area impacted by the Wangina event marked by extensive deposits of sediment resulting from the mega tsunami. The study indicates that the tsunami inundated the bay, infilling the embayment with a mixture of sand, gravel and shell, which now comprises deposits that rise at least 6 metres above the swash limit of typical storm surges. This substantial accumulation of material is indicative of the powerful forces at play during the tsunami, providing clear evidence of its extensive reach and the wave's ability to transport sediments over considerable distances. The characteristics of these deposits suggest that the force of the wave was strong enough to overcome natural coastal barriers, demonstrating the catastrophic impact of the tsunami on the landscape. Furthermore, the sedimentary layers provide valuable insights into the timing and magnitude of the event, allowing researchers to piece together the history of the region and understand how such extreme natural occurrences can drastically alter the environment. The Wangina event is supported by radiocarbon dating of shell deposits along the Kimberley coastline, especially at Collier Bay. As mentioned earlier, these dates indicate that the most recent mega tsunami in the region occurred around the 17th century, coinciding with the age of the Wangina paintings. The rock art itself symbolised something far more powerful and significant. One legend recounts a catastrophic flood initiated by the Starwith Trails. According to this tale, the Wangina caused a great flood that originated in northern Australia and inundated the entire land. Just as swiftly as the flooding occurred, the waters receded. The effects of a mega tsunami occurring around the 17th century can be traced along a 1500 km stretch of coastline. Efforts are currently underway to collect additional datable materials from the Kimberley coastline in order to refine the chronological framework. The exact cause of the Wangina event remains uncertain, but the most likely explanation is a comet or meteor impact in the ocean to the west of Australia. Such an impact would have generated an immense wave, capable of reaching the farthest corners of the Kimberley region. While no impact crater has yet been found, the geomorphic evidence and the alignment of indigenous legends strongly suggest a cosmic origin. Through the study of affected areas like Walcott Inlet, Cape Voltaire and Collier Bay, we gain valuable insights into the geological processes and historical events that have defined the Kimberley region. The integration of indigenous legends with geological evidence underscores the significance of oral histories in preserving the memory of such catastrophic occurrences. As we continue to explore and understand the impact of the Wangina event, it becomes clear that the interplay between natural phenomena and human experience is vital for grasping the complexities of our environment and the stories that emerge from it. I hope you found this topic to be as interesting as I did, and as always, thanks for watching.
Before I end this video, I'd like to give a big shout out to my Patreon and YouTube members. Thank you so much to everyone that helps to support this channel.